right, so uh, um, there are many things I want to tell you today, maybe too many, so uh, if it goes over, just stop me. Okay, so uh, let me recall a little bit the context we introduced last time. So we are starting with the um, Hilbert space. And for now, we look at the simple case where the dimension is finite. So we introduced the uh, space of uh, observables. It's called A. And These are operators on H. And the only requirement is that they must be self-adjoint. So we also introduced the space of what is called states. Uh, what was it? S. So these are also endomorphisms of H, uh, but here there are many more conditions. So they are also self-adjoint. They are non-negative. And they are of trace one. Now there is something that um, I forgot to tell you last time, and maybe let's spend five, 10 minutes and I I tell you some small story. Um, so let's say we have a vector in H of length one. Then recall that last time we defined a projector on the one dimensional line, on the one dimensional subspace, which is spanned by this vector. And uh, this projector it works like that, so it's given by the Hermitian product of the vector with the generator times the generator, right? So recall that the Hermitian product is linear in the second term and anti-linear in the first term. Now, um, so let, let me also recall that such projectors, they are by definition, so orthogonal orthogonal projections like that are self-adjoined. It's easy to verify the, that they are non-negative. And the trace is equal to one, right? Because there is one eigenvalue equal to one, and all the other eigenvalues are equal to zero, right? So, in fact, we have two interpretations for, for such projectors. We can think that they are observables, but we can also think that they are states. So, uh, we already discussed as a state, So they define very special states, which are called pure states. But now maybe uh, one question which remains, what do they mean as observables? So probably those of you who already started quantum mechanics as a physics course, you probably would have some idea so what's the opinion of the experts? What, what are those observables, right? So the states correspond to length one vectors. So that's, that's something that we learned last time, or that's something that we learned in quantum mechanics. But now, what, what, what are they as observables? What are, what are the words? Let's say, of course, 
the mathematical formalism defines for us those observables. Observables are self-adjoint operators, orthogonal projections are self-adjoint operators. But uh, what do they measure? Right? Because an observable, you imagine something like a physical quantity. I don't know, mass, velocity, position, something. So what, what do those things measure? So th this is in some way a question about the dictionary, the words that we should use when connecting from the mass formalism to the so, so to say physics world. So the experts in quantum mechanics, your opinion? Say it. So what's the meaning of this observable? So let me, I'll ask this question in one minute, so please be prepared. Uh, so let me recall that we can associate, so say, we take this observable, PU, and we associate to it uh, a probability density. So we, we consider, where did we write the observable? I think the observable we were writing down here, and, uh, uh, no, I think we are writing it, and we consider it in the pure state. So that's the state, that's the observable, right? So there will be a probability density here. So this probability density will be a linear combination of delta functions which correspond to eigenvalues. So what are the eigenvalues of this guy? So they are 1 and 0, right? So there will be a delta of lambda minus 1 plus the coefficient delta of lambda. So in total, so that's, uh, that's 0 and that's 1, and we can, measure, we can measure one of those. And here there will be probabilities. So what are those probabilities? Here, let me recall the probability it's just a trace of a product of the observable times the state. And here will be a probability uh, which is 1 minus this guy. And uh, if you look at it, if you look at it, what will it be? So uh, I think we should take. 1 minus PU times PV, right? So if you follow the rules, that, that, that what will happen. But let's focus on this one. So let me ask again, what does it measure, this observable? So the observable PU. I think it measures a very simple thing, whether the system is in the state defined by, the, uh, by, this, uh, uh, by this projection. So this projection has a double role. It's an observable and a state. And the observable measures whether we are in the state defined by the same projection. So uh, physics. physics interpretation to the observable, which is given by the projection, measures, oh, let me take it in quotation marks, whatever this word means in physics, whether the system is in the state PU. You see that that's a funny thing that we are now using, using the same projection, right? It's the same orthogonal projection on the same one-dimensional space, but we're using it in two capacities. So why are you, uh, 
uh, am I talking about it? Because from time to time, in quantum mechanics and also in mathematical quantum mechanics, you are asked, so what's the probability that the state is in a, that the system is in a given state? And typically, the state is defined as a pure state defined by some vector, <coughs> right? So this is uh, a linguistical question, right? So to it sh should correspond some mathematical question. So now I'm telling you what, what people actually want to know. So they, they want to know uh, what's the expectation value of this observable in a given state. The state may be a pure state or not a pure state, whatever you want. But the observable should be the, what, this one-dimensional projection. So maybe uh, I think we already done this calculation maybe in less detail last time. However, let me compute this trace. So there is a trace of uh, PU times PV. U and V are two uh, unit vectors in the Hilbert space and we are computing the trace of the product of these two projections. So let me do the following. Let me use an orthonormal basis in H and I denote it by EI sum from 1 to N. So then uh, we know what is this trace. So this trace is sum over I from 1 to N, EI, and here PU, PV, EI. Right, that's one of the formulas for the trace. So just the sum of diagonal matrix elements of that operator in some basis. Now we know how, how these guys act. So that's the sum 1 to n, pi, and here pu, and here how was it? v, pi times v, right? That's the action of the projection. Now, uh, the Hermitian product is linear in this first term, so I can rewrite it as a sum V E I and here E I P U V. So that I again can compute. I and here I can compute it like this, right? UV times V. And finally, I obtain the Hermitian product of U and V times sum from 1 to N VEI <coughs> EI U. And now, since this is an orthonormal basis, this is just uh, a Hermitian product of V and U. So this is UV times VU. And by the, Hermitian, by, by the complex conjugation property, this is the same as absolute value of UV squared. So that's the formula that we already saw last time. And now we see it again. So that's the probability uh, to measure one in the state PV for the observable PU. And this means that if you start with this state and you want to measure what's the probability to find your system in the, uh, in the state PU, so then that's, that's this formula. Um, so how does it tell me, uh, like, okay, now, we spent a couple of minutes on doing first year linear algebra. Is it okay if I do it from time to time? It's, I think, okay, that's, that of course, you can probably do it better than I do, but is, is it okay if from time to time I do elementary things? Okay, good. Um, so that, that's what I wanted to tell you from the last time. There is this, uh, kind of double interpretation of uh, orthogonal projections. 
And this formula is a very, very elementary formula, but in, in, in quantum theory and quantum physics, so on the physics side, this is one of the greatest formulas, right? So that's, this formula has, whatever, huge applications in physics. So now I want to turn uh, to a somewhat more mathematical aspect of the theorem. So let me copy again. Uh, I erased it, but I, I should not have erased it. So um, so let me say again that observables A are self-adjoint operators. Now let's do um, a simple thing. Let's consider the imaginary unit times that space. So in fact, what are these guys? So if I multiply self-adjoint operators by imaginary unit, so their self-adjoint property will be lost. Instead, it will be replaced by the property that they're anti-self-adjoint. So those anti-self-adjoint operators, they have an interesting, um, an interesting property. So they form something uh, which is called the Lie algebra on the commutator. So as usual here, I probably have to, to ask you, so uh, who of you doesn't know what is a Lie algebra? Okay, so it's, it's absolutely no problem. I'll, I'll tell you the definition. So first of all, so let me recall that the commutator of matrices is defined simply as B1, B2 minus B2, B1. Now, um, the first statement in this fact is as follows. So this commutator Uh, preserves this this space I A. So indeed, suppose we uh, suppose <coughs> B one and B two are in I A. So then um, if you apply uh, a Hermitian conjugation to this commutator, what will happen? So you will have B1, B2 minus B2, B1 star. Uh, recall star changes the order in the product. So you will get B2 star, B1 star minus B1 star, B2 star. Now by this property, Star changes the sign, but since there are two, uh, two factors in each of the terms, it changes sign twice, so they get B2, B1 minus B1, B2. And this is exactly minus the commutator of B1 and B2. So that's the first property. There is something which is called the Lie bracket. So it takes two of those operators and it gives the third one, which is just a commutator. So two more properties that one needs to verify. So the first property is that B1, B2 is equal to minus B2, B1. which is also known as skew symmetry. So this is completely obvious, right? 
That's just because the commutator is made, made like that. So the third property, probably most of you have seen it. Uh, it says the following. Take a double commutator, B1, with commutator B2, B3. And now take a sum of three terms like that, which are cyclical in 1, 2, 3. So 1, 2, 3, 3, 1, 2, 2, 3, 1. So there will be three terms. So this sum must be zero. And this is called the Jacobi identity. I guess most of you at some point in your either linear algebra or quantum mechanics or somewhere, you probably checked that actually it works. Those of you who never checked it, please do it as a small homework. So you just should open all those commutators and you will get how many? Two, four, 12 terms, right? 12 terms and all those 12 terms should cancel each other. So, now, um, one example, and a couple of observations. <laughs> So remember last time our favorite example was the story of a Hilbert space equal to C2. And then we introduced the three Pauli matrices, which were elements of A. So they're observables. Now, um, well, so they are observable, so, so they don't form a Lie algebra. However, uh, you see this notation indicates that it's actually easy to turn them into generators of a Lie algebra. So let's consider, for instance, the following combinations. For whatever, historic reasons or for physical reasons, I divide them by two, but it doesn't matter. So I multiply each of them by i, and I divide by two. Well, <coughs> now for two of them, one can ask, what will be the commutator? So someone knows the answer by heart. No delta A B. The experts make a mistake here. <laughs> okay, let me let me write the answer. And I, I think actually the answer I, I tried to compute it correctly, but, well, I hope I did compute it correctly, but still, you need to check. You need to check my computations, usually. I think it will be something like this. And my hesitation is about this minus sign. We'll come, we'll come back to discussing it. So you see, this, this is a sum of a C of some quantity epsilon A, B, C that I should explain now. And times the similar generator, I sigma C over 2. So I get from uh, this I over 2 of a Pauli matrix, if I take a commutator, I get again I over 2 of a Pauli matrix. Now what is, what is epsilon A, B, C? So, uh, it's equal to plus one if ABC is a positive permutation of one to three.
permutation of 1 to 3 is equal to minus 1 if A, B, C is a negative permutation of 1 to 3 and 0 otherwise. So what does it mean otherwise? If it's not a permutation of 1 to 3, this means that A, B, C has repeating indices, right? If it has repeating indices, it's 0. If it is 1 to 3, 3, 1, 2, and 2, 3, 1, it's plus 1. And if these are the other uh, three permutations of 1 to 3, the negative ones, then it is minus 1. So, for instance, I claim I claim this, and so on. Uh, so, why I was hesitant with the minus sign? Why don't Why don't I remember it by heart in such a standard example? Um, that's because, you see, this transition from observables to elements of a Lie algebra is somewhat arbitrary, right? So, yes, I should multiply by i, I should uh, divide by 2 for some whatever historical or physical reasons, but for instance, I could have added here minus signs, right? That would also be a elements of the Lie algebra. And note that if I add minus signs everywhere, minus sign here, minus sign here, minus sign here, the sign here will change, right? Because on the left, there will be two minus signs, and on the right, there will be only one. So in principle, if I do this, then this minus sign will disappear. Maybe one notational remark. Some of you probably know it, but for those of you who, who don't know, so this is called, so this Lie algebra has a special name, and it's a kind of funny name, SU2, so special unitary of dimension 2. At the moment, it doesn't, doesn't matter for us too much, but so that's, uh, uh, that's an interesting example. Now, um, a remark. Well, I said that the uh, commutator preserves IA. So you take a commutator of two elements of IA, you get an element of IA. But now what about observables? We'll see that IA also plays a big role in this theory, but what about observables themselves? So two facts. Let me write it in the following way, and you tell me whether it's understandable. So what does it mean? So if I take a commutator of an element of IA and an element of A of an observable, I get again an observable. So that's, that's what, what these notations say. Now, I'm not going to check it again, but please check it. So that's, that's, an easy, that's an easy fact. So you can produce new observables by taking commutators with elements of IA. Finally, from time to time, and actually at the next hour, We'll have to take commutators of observables as well. In general, this does not make, make that much sense. However, if one checks the formulas, it turns out that the commutator of two observables is sitting in IA. Okay. So that's a new and interesting structure. So we'll make use of this structure quite a lot. Um, but maybe now um, what I want to do, I want to formulate 
some quite fundamental theorem, if I'm not mistaken, that's probably the first statement that we call a theorem. in this course. Of course, one should take a little bit with a grain of salt. And as I said in the beginning, this is, um, this is not quite the standard mass course, right? So up to now, we didn't have really a kind of statements that we prove. OK, let's try. So this theorem is called the Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. And it's formulated in the following way. So suppose yeah, let me call them A1 and A2. I wanted to call them A and B, but now B I denoted the elements of IA. So all right. So let's say we have a1 and A2, two observables. And then we have M, a state. So then there is the following inequality. Uh, I'll write it down and then I recall the notation. So the variance or the square of the standard deviation of a1, that's all in the state M, times the variance of A2 in the same state M is bound from below by one fourth absolute value of trace of M times the commutator of A and B squared. You see, um, so that's, that's a very, very interesting inequality. But maybe first, a kind of formal remark. On the right hand side, remember, we, we had this discussion of the commutators uh, just some minutes ago. And the commutator, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's what happens when you change notation on the way. So, uh, so that's a commutator of A1 and A2. Um, so, so this guy, strictly speaking, is not an observable, right? This commutator of A1 and A2. In principle, if you multiply it by I, then it becomes observable. So you can, if you want, put here an i or minus i. <coughs> and then, of course, since you have an absolute value here anyways, so the, the situation does not change. Right. OK. Um, so now let me give you a proof. And maybe in the course of the proof, I also remind you what, this, um, what these things are. So the proof starts with the following remark. And maybe if, if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't quite remember. D D Donald, could you recall me? So this, this is a statement of one of the exercises. But for today or for, uh, uh, for, for the next day, so, so the claim is, say, if uh, A and B uh, Ah, your mission. And positive. Then the trace is non negative. So this is Yeah, 
So that's on the problem set three, right? So uh, for this reason, I, I, I'm not going to prove it. Especially, I think it's actually homework. <coughs> right, so you prove it. Uh, but we, we assume that it's true. So you take a trace of a product of two positive self-adjoint operators, you get some number which is non-negative. Now, um, another remark. Suppose you take any operator. So then, which one I want? Then the operator x star x is self-adjoint and non-negative. So why is it the case? Well, self-adjoint is just trivial. So I, I take a Hermitian adjoint of this x star x. I guess x star times x star star. But since Hermitian conjugation is an involution, I get x star x. Now, why is it positive? So that's because if I take some vector u and I consider the action of x star x on u and the Hermitian product with u, then I can use the definition of the adjoint operator and bring x here. So this will be the same as xq xu. And this is the square of the norm of xu. And this is, this is non-negative. All right. So now, I do the following. <coughs> so I consider a real parameter S. And uh, I construct the following function of this real parameter S. This is a trace of A1 plus IS a2 star times a1 plus is a2 times m. So note that here, what I have, I have a trace of a star of an operator times this operator <coughs> times m. Now, uh, by this uh, remark that I gave you before, uh, this factor is actually a positive or non-negative Hermitian operator, right? So this guy is a non-negative Hermitian operator. M is a state. And by definition, M is non-negative. Right? So this means that by, by this exercise that you are supposed to solve for next time, uh, this uh, combination is always non-negative. Now, Let's, um, let's open the brackets. Let's uh, apply this star. So all in all, we have the following. Let's apply this star. We get A1 star minus IS A2 star times A1 plus IS A2 times M.
Now recall that A1 and A2 are observables. So this means uh, actually I can forget those stars if I want. Now what we get? We get trace A1 squared times M. Now here will be minus and minus from the product of two i's plus s square trace a2 square times m and and so what do we get here um, um, plus I S trace A one A two minus A two A one times M. Is it correct? So it was A one A two minus A two A one. Okay. Now maybe it's better to put this i inside here because recall then so this this commutator is anti self adjoint if you multiply by i it becomes self adjoint and then this trace becomes real so in fact what we have here this function of s is a quadratic polynomial with real coefficients. And it's always greater or equal to zero. Then from, is it like high school or secondary school, right? So then we know that there is the following inequality. Right? So this should be greater or equal than one fourth of the square of this linear coefficient, right? So that's, that's just because it's a quadratic polynomial. All right, so now the right-hand side is fine. What about the left-hand side? So that's actually the inequality that we get. Now, um, let me recall. So now, now, now we still need to get the inequality from the Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. And the inequality from the Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, so the, the variance of uh, the variance of A, I don't quite remember how did we denote it. So in the state M, right, or sigma A squared, what is it? So uh, one possible definition uh, is the, uh, would be the trace of A minus A bar squared times M. That's just for the probability theory, what the definition of the variance. And A bar is just a number. Trace of AM, the mean value of, uh, of our quantum observable A in the state M. So that's, that's the definition. So now we want to replace the left-hand side of our inequality by this left-hand side. So those two left-hand sides are not quite the same, right? Now what do we do? Just subtract from A1. Right, so, um, so in fact what we do, so let's call this star. 
So u star for a1 tilde equal to a1 minus a1 bar. a1 bar is just a number. And when I write a1 bar, I mean the unit, unit operator proportional to a1 bar. So a2 bar equal to a2 minus a2 bar. And observe that the commutator of a1 tilde a to tilde is simply equal to the commutator of a1 and a2. That's because you subtract something proportional to 1. Commutator of 1 with anything is 0. So this means that the commutator doesn't change. Now, once you replaced a1 with a1 bar, this becomes sigma a1 squared. This becomes sigma a2 squared. And this guy doesn't change. So therefore, we get the uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty relation theorem. There is one, one false, yes. Oh, I think this means that the correct one was one false, right? You're right. Actually, I don't quite know. In my notes, it is one false. I don't know how this one, one half got there. And of course, the, the correct one is one false. If you take a square root of it, you will get one half. All right, so uh, let's have a break and then we discuss a little bit more. We, we'll, we'll spend more time with the Heisenberg uncertainty. We'll get back to it. But uh, yeah, so it probably it's a good time to stop and have a break. Okay, so, um, so this inequality, uh, what does it say? It says that potentially if the commutator is non-vanishing, then of course depending on this, still depending on the state, but potentially uh, the product of variances cannot be zero. Perhaps one small, one small comment about it. So what happens if the commutator is zero. So we remark. So assume that the commutator is zero. Um, well, first of all, the theorem, the Heisenberg uncertainty, at this point says nothing, right? Because the right-hand side is zero, the left-hand side is the product of two positive quantities. Well, I mean, it's, it's trivially satisfied, so nothing, nothing happens. Uh, but actually, we know a lot more. Suppose you have two self-adjoint operators which commute then you probably know from linear algebra, I guess, do you? So that they can be, how it's called, simultaneously diagonalized, right? So um, in other words, maybe I, I write uh, a somewhat more abstract formula. So. Um, Um, so, uh, so there are eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda n, and here possibly possibly with repetitions. Uh, and similarly, There are eigenvalues mu1, mu n. There is e1, e n.
to an autonormal basis of H such that K1 admits the spectral decomposition lambda sum over lambda i p i and A2 admits the spectral decomposition mu i p i where p i is a projector on e i or if you write it in matrices, right? So we now have a basis and we can write it in matrices. So A1 will be represented by a diagonal matrix, lambda 1, lambda n, and A2 will be represented by a diagonal matrix mu1, mu n. So that's that we know from linear algebra. I don't know whether it was in your linear algebra course. If not, look it up. Uh, so now let me recall. That if you have uh, an observable and we choose a state which corresponds to an eigenvector of the observable. So then in this eigens uh, eigenstate, the variance is zero, right? So that's because uh, if we measure it, we get the corresponding eigenvalue. Now, these two observables, they have lots of common eigenvectors. So all the, all the EIs are common eigenvectors. So this means for every projector PI, We have sigma A1 equal to sigma A2 equals zero, right? So in this state, there is no uncertainty. There is no probability theory. So in the state I, A1 is equal to lambda I and A2 is equal to mu I. No uncertainty. Uh, the standard deviation is zero. The variance is zero. So the left-hand side is actually zero. Not only it may be zero because we don't have an estimate, but actually in those states, it is exactly zero. So um, we'll return to those observables which have vanishing commutators a bit later. But now I want to present you the last axiom Remember, we started last time with some axioms which introduced observables and states and measurements. And uh, now that's the last axiom. So quantum mechanics actually introduces for you a dynamical system. So, axiom A5 Let's call it quantum dynamics So this quantum dynamics comes in uh, uh, two different forms We'll start with one of them So, first of all, this axiom says that there is a distinguished observable called uh, 
the Hamiltonian of the system. And um, let me let me first define this um, dynamical system or the quantum evolution in the so-called Schrodinger picture. We'll see now what this means. So um, it says the following that um, um, there is a differential equation or ordinary ordinary dif differential equation on this space of states S and this differential equation looks as follows. We now say that the state depends on a parameter. This parameter is called time. And the right hand side, again, I shouldn't mix kind of screw it with the signs. looks as follows. So this is minus i times the um, commutator of uh, this observable h with the state. And well, this, um, this is the so-called Planck constant. Uh, to be honest, for us in the mathematical theory, it is somewhat optional. So there are different, different approaches that we can take to it. Of course, in physics, that's a very important con constant. So what we can do, we can think that this is simply a positive real number. So that's one approach. So one possible choice for it would be to put this positive real number to be equal to one, right? That's one possibility. So another possibility to keep it as a positive real number. One possibility that we perhaps explore later on is uh, to treat H as an indeterminate or as a formal parameter. So we can actually study the dependence of our dynamical system on this H bar. Um, of course, in physics, this H bar is actually a positive real number which has a concrete value. But we don't care so much. Right. Uh, so, so this is a very, very simple differential equation. Perhaps I should add the following. So recall that among the states, we have those so-called pure states, right? So we have pure states, which are discussed, which are defined by projections. And projections defined by unit vectors. Now you may actually ask uh, what would be the evolution, what would be the dynamics of that unit vector. So this is, um, this is a version of the axiom 5. You can actually, instead of imposing this condition, you can impose the following condition. You can say that the unit vector which defines a pure state depends on T. And is defined by this differential equation. So now H is an operator acting on the vector. So that's another form. 
of the same axiom. So as experts in, in linear algebra, what's your feeling? Are these two statements equivalent? Suppose that I restrict myself here to pure states. So, are they equivalent? What's your, well, what's your guess? They should. They better be. But uh, I think mm, l linear algebraically, it's more or less obvious they're not. Why? Um, I think you will have a rather easy time to show that if you uh, if U uh, evolves like this, then the corresponding pure state, PU, will evolve like that. So that's, that's, that's an easy task. However, the other way around, uh, I have doubts. And that's for the following reason. Suppose you add to your Hamiltonian, suppose you add some constant times the unit operator. So what's going to happen? So here, strictly nothing going to happen because in the commutator, this term will die. So here, well, there will be consequences. For sure, when, when I do this, the evolution of, the, uh, unit, of this unit vector changes. So, in fact, it's not, not going to work the other way around. But remember, maybe you, you forgot or maybe you didn't forget. Last time I told you that actually uh, those unit vectors, they are not quite states, right? You should divide them by an equivalence relation. And the equivalence relation is multiplying by uh, some complex number with absolute value equal to 1. And actually what's going to happen here, if you, if you add to, uh, to this operator some constant times 1, so then uh, it will turn out that eventually it will change u by such an overall phase. And anyways, you're supposed to consider those u's modular module this equivalence relation, so uh, it changes U module equivalence relation. S but, but still, just, just I wanted to tell you, we're going to use those equations as if they were equivalent. But maybe from time to time it's good to remember that, strictly speaking, they are not completely equivalent. And that U, we, it, it's very convenient, most people, like whatever, 99% of people doing quantum mechanics work with this equation. It's relatively rarely that people work with that equation. So, but this equation is conceptually correct. This equation is slightly conceptually incorrect. Slightly. But again, so we, usually when people say uh, a time-dependent Schrodinger equation, so they, they mean this. Right. Okay. So now I would like to So now I would like to make a small linear algebraic digression. I want to say one of the last ones in the course but you never know, right? So one small digression that you probably all familiar with, or maybe not, but just, just to make sure. Um, I would like to recall the following. Suppose we have an operator on H. H is finite dimensional, and the operator is not necessarily self-adjoint, anything. So then, One can define the exponential function.
of this operator just by the standard series for the exponential. Um, now, this series is actually absolutely convergent for all A. By the way, um, for matrices or for operators, what, what does it mean absolutely convergent? Just, just to check. Absolutely convergent under, yeah, say for instance, whatever, any, after all, the space of matrices is a finite dimensional space, all norms on that space are equivalent, so whatever, operator norm, any other reasonable norm that you can invent. So it's, it's absolutely convergent. And it has the following properties. I'll list some of them. Of course, exponential of zero is the unit matrix or unit operator, identity operator. Um, exponential of a Hermitian conjugate, exponential of the adjoint. is the adjoint of the exponential. Um, exponential of a conjugate where G is an invertible operator. Is a conjugate of the exponential. Um, Exponential of minus the operator is the inverse operator of the exponential. And maybe something which so I take two parameters and take exponentials of A times those parameters. Well, as a good, as a good exponential, simply uh, those things add up. So, does it all look familiar? Nobody concerned about it? All right, maybe Still one remark. So this, all, all this holds true. Uh, however, as you can probably imagine, if I take the product of exponentials of two operators, in general, this is not the exponential of the sum. Right. So we'll we'll talk more about it. Maybe um, I'll just state one formula. If we have time later on, maybe we prove it at some point. It's called the Lee Trotter formula. And it will be of some importance for us towards the end of the course. Um, so this formula tells you something. So th there are actually, uh, so th this story is a big field. So there are many things that people do in different fields of mass about this relation between exponential A, exponential B, and exponential of A plus B. So it sounds as a silly linear, uh, linear algebra problem, but actually it's an entry to a big field. Now let me show you one of the formulas that we will be using later in the course. And it says the following, that if you take exponential of A divided by N, and you 
multiplied by exponential of b divided by n, you take a power n and you take a limit of n going to infinity. So, so you, you, you take um, a natural number n, so you first divide these things, you multiply, and then you send n to infinity. This is actually equal to exponential of a plus b. So as I say, maybe at some point we even prove it, but think about it. Think how you would prove it. That's uh, a mix between first year calculus and first year linear algebra. Um, so this formula is not true, but if you give a small analytic twist to it, then it becomes kind of almost true in the end to infinity limit. So why did I, why did I decide to tell you, to recall you this story? That's because we would like to solve the, uh, this equation. So let's try to solve this equation. Um, in order to do that, um, may I raise it? Or, okay. because I want to keep the, um, the equations on the other blackboard. So let me recall you the definition of u of h. So these are operators on h which satisfy the rule g star times g is equal to 1. So these are unitary operators. And in particular, from this, it follows that g is invertible, right? Because we have an explicit inverse. g star is the inverse of g. Right. So now, um, here we mark. If you have B in IA, then exponential of B is a unitary. So B is anti self adjoint then exponential of b is a unitary, and that's uh, so that's easy to see. So if we compute the adjoint of the exponential of b, this will be exponential of b star, and this is equal to exponential of minus b, and by one of the properties, That's the exponential of b to the power minus 1. Now let's define the operator u of t. is the exponential of minus i over h times t. Now, um, for t real, yeah, for t real. It's clear that this guy, so this uh, combination is an IA, right? Because we have real numbers and then we have this i so it moves it to ia 
And then this means that this operator is unitary. Now claim. So let me denote this equation as CH for Schrodinger. So let's take any vector U0 and let's consider u of t, this operator acting on that vector, so this gives us a family of vectors which now depend on t. And this is the unique solution of SCH with u of 0 equal to u naught. So let me briefly check that this is indeed the case. So uh, We compute the derivative, and this derivative is d over dt of this u of t times u naught. But recall the properties of the exponential function, right? So when in the first year calculus you derive the derivative of the exponential function, you're basically using the property of the exponential function to be additive. Uh, or whatever, multiplicative. Now recall that here if you change t, so this, uh, this function satisfies exactly the same property as the ordinary exponential function. You only get a very different behavior when you try to multiply exponentials with different operators there. But if you just have the same operator, so then this function behaves exactly as a function uh, of uh, one variable. So this means that you can differentiate this expression with respect to t and get minus 1 over h capital H and here you will still have u of t u naught. By the way, why do I write it to the left and not to the right? minus i over h, h. Because it doesn't matter, right. Once we have just the same operator, it doesn't matter. I could have written it to the right, but I find it convenient to write it to the left. And this is equal to minus i over h, h, e of t. Uh, so, um, so this, um, this vector does satisfy um, this differential equation that this is a unique solution followed by the uniqueness of solutions of ODEs, of with, con with constant coefficients. Right. Um, you probably don't need this motivation, but for me it's difficult not to say it. You know, when I teach the first year linear algebra and I have to motivate why do we want to do whatever this so is, unitary operators, why, why do we want to study it? I say the following words. See, so this Schrodinger equation, it's an equation which describes any quantum system, right? Of course, we said that H, uh, that the Hilbert space was finite dimensional, but let's for a moment ignore it. 
Let's say, for instance, our quantum system is the universe. Now, that's the equation which describes the evolution of the universe. Just this H is some very, very huge operator acting on some very, very big space, but otherwise, that's this equation. And note, uh, this is the solution of this equation, right? It's already sufficiently surprising to write in one line an equation which describes the evolution of the universe. It's, I think I find it even more uh, intriguing and surprising that here is just this very simple solution. So which contains all the information on what happens everywhere, in particular in this room, and, and so on. Of course, here, I mean, we are cheating somewhere, right? Still, there is some, also some truth in what we are saying. So those uh, very simple-minded layout of formulas that we are writing now, um, they are kind of important, and they have some, some kind of ambition in them. All right. Now, maybe somewhat less um, somewhat less uh, ambitious words, somewhat more technical. Um, so this uh, operator, it's called the evolution the evolution operator. Um, maybe um, one more word here. Um, so another word or another name for this uh, observable is the energy. And in particular, usually we were denoting the eigenvalues of, uh, of our operators by lambdas. But the traditional notation for the eigenvalues of H is the letter E because that's the energy. At least these are, these are the words that we are supposed to say on the physics side. Um, all right. Um, so now I would like to, I would like to uh, introduce another picture. As I said, um, the axiom 5 comes in some way in two versions. I already introduced the one version and then the other version, but now there will be an entirely, an entirely different version which is in some way equivalent. So the dynamical system that we introduced in the Schrodinger picture is saying that the state of the system evolves this time. Maybe let me, let me, before doing that, let me make one more remark. We solved the Schrodinger equation for the pure state, for the unit vector. We can also easily solve the Schrodinger equation uh, for, the, uh, for the generic state, m of t. And the solution will be now, u of t, m naught, u of t inverse, is a solution with m of 0 equal to m naught. So this simply follows from from, from solution of this equation. So vectors get multiplied by u of t. States get conjugated by u of t. 
Now um, a5 tilde which is called the Heisenberg picture. We're not going to use it very often. You will see why, why we want to have it. So in the Heisenberg picture, the dynamical system is organized differently. Instead of saying that the states evolve, we say in a bit strange way that the states are always the same. However, what happens That's the operators or observables observables evolve. So you fix the state of your system once and for all and you say that the observables that change with time um, there is, of course, in some way also some intuitive meaning into that because, I don't know, in classical mechanics, imagine you have that chalk and the observable is the position of that chalk and now the chalk moves. So the position changes. So I guess that's, that's how people were thinking about it. But whatever it is, for, for us, it's simply Remember, our quantum system has two pieces in a description, observables that we can measure and the state. We measure them in some state. Now, in the Schrodinger picture, we are saying that the state evolves with time according to this law. And in the Heisenberg picture, the states do not evolve with time. However, what evolves with time are observables. Now, um, a simple fact is as follows. Um, so suppose we consider the mean value of A, which is equal to a trace of AM. So that's something that we supposedly can observe. Now, um, In the Schrodinger picture, this is a trace of uh, A, let's call it A0, times M of T. The observable never changes. But in the Heisenberg picture, this is A of T times M0. Now, let me substitute here this solution of the Schrodinger equation. So recall that M of T gets conjugated, right? Now, can you guess the solution of the equation for A of t? Right? It's a very similar equation where we change the sign, right? Now, if we change the sign, this means that here we'll have to replace u of t by u of t inverse, right? In the solution. Now, uh, notice that these two equations are simply equal to each other. Right? Because you can, by under the trace, you can move this u of t minus 1 to here. So that's called the equivalence between the uh, Schrodinger and the Heisenberg picture. In fact, we're not going to 
use that much the Heisenberg picture, but um, I wanted to show it, this, this remark to you because first of all, that's one of the simple and fundamental statements in mathematical quantum mechanics. And also because it motivates for you uh, an interesting definition So A in IA is a, well, here there are different names. Is a conserved quantity. Or sometimes people say quantum integral. If if the commutator of H and A vanishes, now we know why this is uh, this is uh, an interesting consideration. Uh, that's because in the Heisenberg picture, the corresponding operator doesn't change. It's also because if you take the uh, if you take the time derivative of the mean value in whatever picture you want, right? The two pictures are equivalent. You will get zero. In particular, let's do it in the Schrodinger picture because that's the picture that we kind of like. Right, so that's, that's what the original axiom A5 was saying. And now under the trace, you can bring the commutator on A. And this is equal to zero. So um, I think we'll stop here for today and next time we'll try to explore more of this situation of uh, what happens with those conserved quantities or quantum integrals of motion. Okay, well, that's it for today.